Welcome to this Arctic Art and Feminism, session number two. My name is Mali, I'm the Diversity Manager of Wikimedia Norway. Today you're going to meet Lisa Ravna Finnbog again, uh, a Sami scholar, museologist, who has written about Duoji as a Sami knowledge system. Uh, she will be talking to Maria Carlsen, uh, Sami uh, student at the uh, Oslo National Academy of the Arts here in Oslo. Um, she is studying, or, or she's also using Doji in her studies and as a way of um, finding back to her Sami roots. Enjoy. Okay, yes, so, conversation about Doji. Where do you want to start? Um, that's a very open question. Uh, we can start with, I mean, for me, I got into, I mean, I say I got into Doji, which is not the best way of putting it. It's more like I was, um, I was born into Doji, right? So <laughs> for me, like the road to Doji is, I think is slightly different from yours because it's always been around. I wasn't that interested when I was young. I was more, for me, what was interesting about Doji was this opportunity to sit with the women uh, right and listen to they gossip and talk and I understood maybe like 20% of what they were talking about but just sitting there surrounded by all of these people working together and being happy and laughing and you know that for me is one of my earliest memories of Dutti and then as I grew older and you know this you know in my family my mom made you know, my mom made most of our gaffes. Sometimes an aunt would make them, but we were four kids. And then my dad, who was uh, a representative of the Sami parliament. So it was kind of, you had to queue up to get a new gaffe. And eventually I just realized that, you know, I need to start making my own. And so that was where I initially came into like being more serious with my duetti. And then mm -hmm. it just grew from there. Yeah. I don't know how it, for you. Yes, because as you said, we had very different roles because I got into Dorje. Uh, I didn't have the privilege of growing oh. up surrounded by it because of uh, colonialism, as we all know. Uh, so I realized after I had moved away from home and I was sort of a grown up that I was Sami. Yeah. Uh, and luckily for me, I was already always crafting. So Dorje was very, um, very av available for me. It was uh, right there and it was a way of me to reclaim some of my Saminas that had been taken from me and my family. Mm. And also because no one else in my family is practicing Dutchi or my mom has come around, which is lovely. Uh, but I had to make everything for myself. Yeah. Uh, and there's also so much power in that to make your own Gakti mm. and to just physically grab something that has been taken away from you. Uh, and as I started practicing Duetje, I realized what, what an immense world it is. And it, it feels like the biggest gift that I can be given. Mm. Uh, it's this whole world of aesthetics and knowledge and also this social dimension that you mentioned. Yeah. But that's very, uh, that's sort of a difficult thing for me because I am largely missing this social element of Duetje. Uh, luckily, we have this organization in Oslo that you know very well, Oslo Sami Duetje, yeah. <laughs> uh, that provides some of this, um, some of this social context and you can sit and you can sew and talk yeah. to the other people in your community. Yeah. Uh, but for me, that has been something that I have had to search out for myself. And so the internet has become the answer yeah uh, so i have spent uh, an immense amount of time in these endless facebook discussions that everyone who practices what you know about i think uh, and it's not all good but it's like the closest you can get to a sort of community talking about what and learning yeah. from uh, elders and uh, talented people who Mm. willingly share and mm. uh, so it's also a struggle to sort of incorporate myself into this social setting 
Yeah, because I remember, and I think this was actually the first time you made a gakdi, but uh, Usho Samido uh, and I was the leader at the time, we had this um, gakdi workshop, so mm. gakdi bachi, yes. where, uh, um, you know, in the place, you know, the spots, we had like 20 available spots and they were filled up like, you know, five minutes and everything was, you know, every spot was occupied. Um, but I remember you were working, and I think it was the first time, because you were drafting also a pattern and you were mm. working with, um, you know, cutting and making it. And what was so interesting is like talking to you then and talking as opposed to talking to you now, mm. there is this immense growth, yeah. right? And what you said about this, this aspect of knowledge. And I mean, this is basically what I talk about when I say that Dwetje is an epistemology because it is a way that you can gradually insert yourself into mm. a whole world of, you know, knowledge and, uh, and perspective. Mm -hmm. And you get to that point by working with Dwetje. And it's just... Absolutely. But that workshop, it was one of the scariest things I have ever done. I remember I, only, I cried when I filled out the application to sign oh. up oh. Uh, and it was super tough to, for me to go there. I was scared shitless <laughs> uh, and it actually got so scary. It was a lovely experience talking to others and getting help cutting the pattern, but it actually got so scary. So I sort of dropped out and I had to like finish my gakte in silence mm. um, yeah. because it was so overwhelming. Yeah, uh, and in a positive way, but it was difficult dealing with all the stuff that I had missed out on. Yeah, but it was a lovely uh, community, and yeah, uh, I'm so happy that I have been able to to get back to it and continue being part of it. Yeah, yeah, because it's interesting. I mean, I don't think I really. It was only when I like started working with other people doing doji and like incorporating that aspect into my research that I think I like genuinely started to realize how difficult it can you know for me it's always been so easy mm. you know it's it's i've had people around me so if i had questions or something you know i want to know i can go there and i can ask them like how do you, can you help me with this can yeah. you etc etc and and you know it's just i don't think i think it took me a long while to realize how privileged i was i mean um so I wasn't raised in a Sami speaking home. Uh, I learned Sami um, in school. So, so that aspect wasn't there, but at the same time, there was still a Sami aspect. So, you know, the, the knowledge of Doichi and the knowledge of Sami practices and all of that was, you know, that was very centered within my family. Mm. Um, but to, you know, to realize how difficult it can be. And I mean, I get, okay, I don't think I can ever on a personal level understand it, but I get that it must be, you know, I get and I realize that it's about shifting your, the entirety of yourself from a very safe place where you, you know, you've always been comfortable or perhaps not comfortable, but you've, you know, you've had your spot. This is your place to be. And suddenly you're doing something that completely shifts the space. And it's not as if you're going from a place of less privilege to more. It's the opposite. You're going from privilege to less, you know? Yes. And that process, I don't know. It's just, it's interesting, but it's, uh, that people would actually um, consciously work towards reaching a place where they will be less privileged. But at the same time, it just goes to show how important it is. Yeah. Like, the, the right to define yourself, the yes. right to be yourself, yes. no matter what that is. And that goes on different levels, you know? Yes, absolutely. And it has, uh, it has been very difficult for me to justify for myself, taking like away some of my privileges and, mm. and sort of uh, becoming Sami and uh, going into all of this awful history and, and uh, uh, and the colonialism that we have experienced. Yeah. Uh, but I found a mantra early on. And uh, that is that if I don't do this, if I don't own up to my Simoness, I have lost. Yeah. Because it feels like a battle to reclaim it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, no matter what I do, my kids will be Sami. Yeah. 
I can't have Norwegian kids because I am Sami. Yeah. And uh, so it's better to own up to that. Uh, but of course, it's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, it's an immense shift. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess in a, you know it is like a battle. It's 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 really it's a struggle. It's a fight. It's <laughs> it's uh, basically waging war against colonialism and everything that's happened as a result of that. Mm. Uh, and not you know. For me as well, just I I worked very hard to reclaim language. I worked really hard to reclaim. You know, I, I think that when we work with Doji, um, and you know, this world of knowledge opens up, but that's not the same as being able to articulate that world or articulate what that knowledge is. Mm. So that's another process of reclaiming. So for me, I mean, I I really, for me, I felt that. You know, there has been times where it's been so hard working in Western academia, like where people not only didn't like get what I was doing, but also people were kind of upset that I was stating things, claiming things, uh, or didn't really respect what I was doing and had no difficulty letting me know that. And also this, this very, because I am Sami and very open about it, um, also this very like, I don't know how to put it, but this expectance, you know, they, they expected me to be a certain way. And when I didn't conform to that way, that also became an issue. So I've had several like times where I just packed up my stuff and left the office and was gone for, for you know, weeks at a time because mm. I needed a break. That's not to say that, you know, I didn't, it's not to say that the people that I worked closely with at the university wasn't you know the issue wasn't really there the issue what was with the system in itself yes um and so that's sort of been my journey of reclaiming something yes and i think yeah i think i can relate very much to that because uh as we said in the intro i attend the Oslo national academy of the arts uh, and i um, I work exclusively with Duetje uh, in a contemporary art mm. uh, sort of uh, situation. Uh, and, and there's this whole thing of me discovering just how much Duetje is and, and, and the rich world. Yeah. Uh, and then bringing that into a very white institution where you view craft as something completely different and people tend to um, categorize what I do as craft yeah uh, and people tend to categorize Duetje as a, a sort of tool uh, like you would with a with a loom for example mm. uh, you can use the loom you can ma manipulate it you can weave what you want but at the end of the day it's just a tool uh, and people think the same way about Duetje yeah and it's not so I am often also met with people not understanding and asking me but when are you gonna loosen yourself from the duetchi? When are you gonna oh. break free? Yes. Uh, when are you gonna start transcending duetchi? <laughs> as if that was a, if, as if that was a goal. Yeah, yeah. That actually, I, I once gave a talk at uh, Tate Saint Ives. So Tate, um, uh, the, um, they have like these different places where Tate has facilities and I was in Cornwall at St. Ives and one of the audience members actually asked me that uh, like isn't it difficult to live with the tyranny of ancestors I was like okay what <laughs> okay you did not pick up on my meaning at all because it's not about you know I, I, and and this is Whenever we, especially we see it in debates on what gakti is and how you're allowed to make your gakti that oh it's a rigid but you know no really it's not the the rules of doji is not rigid I wouldn't say there are rules as such but it's you know it's the aspects of um, aesthetics of knowledge that sort of guides the way you work mm. with doji and that is not something you ever transcend that just that's something that only increases, you know, it becomes big, the world becomes bigger and bigger, the more you do do it, mm. you know? And I think um, the, the rules of Duetje uh, and the rules of Gekti making, it shows the close link with Duetje and, and society, and that yeah. is the same thing. And, and for your Gekti to be 
approved. It's it's super important. You you need the society's approval. Yeah. You can uh, sew an historically accurate gakte, but if people don't recognize you and don't mm. and aren't able to read the codes and don't accept it, then it's not a good gakte. Yeah. So it's uh, it shows the clear link that yeah, yeah. your gakte relates to everything else, and it must yeah, be yeah. readable. Yeah, and it's, and this is like the aspect of arbedieto of of shared or inherited knowledge, right? That um, that this is a knowledge that has evolved over time. Um, and if you do, I mean, I have seen, so there have been some amazing examples of gaktis being made that maybe differed a little bit from what convention tells you a good gakti should be. And then people have been like, hmm, this was new, but I like it. Because mm -hmm. this is the collectiveness of it all, right? Yes. That, that someone tries something and then we go like, hmm, yeah, I like this. Yeah. I recognize this as being good good doite as yes. opposed to being bad doite. But this is this is something about the eye, like or the gaze, that doing doji, eventually you sort of develop this gaze uh, and that, that allows you to read doji. Because doji, I think you said once that doji is a language. Yes. Right? So you you write with doji. You you make you document with Doji and you read with Doji. Yes. Most importantly, maybe reading. And for me, who is fairly new to Doji and, and having grown up with that, I am uh, extremely aware of this language because I have to learn it. Mm. And I also have to unlearn the other codes that I know, that yeah. the uh, colonial sort of aesthetics that I have. Yeah. I'm still working on unlearning those and shifting yeah. my perspective, and it's yeah. very slow going. Yeah, um, but it's it's an amazing process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I mean I often hear, and also from within the Sami community, like people that are starting to learn, and they, you know, because we, I mean, it's it's human to categorize things, and we categorize almost everything around us, and we, you know, we need to have this familiar this familiar framework to put our categories within to make sense of the world. Mm. So what I often see is people comparing the Gakti to the Norwegian Bunad and like, yes. so this is the same. And I'm like, no, it's not. It is not the same at all. You can't compare the two at all. No. Um, and a lot of that has to do with this knowledge aspect that we're actually talking about a repository of knowledge where ancestral teachings are embedded but also the codes needed to understand mm. your Sami society yes and all of this is shaped by the knowledge and the gaze and I think it's really interesting to see how people and I, we're talking now you know in the span of six months can shift so drastically their opinions about what a gakti is because the more you learn the more you sort of appreciate and understand. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, no, it's just this richness. It's, it's a bit overwhelming to think about sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is. And it's, I, it's like, I gave, I, I talked once to a group of artists and art institutions about Doichi and they were like, one of the comments afterwards, so, because you always have this Q&A and one of the comments afterward was like, so I heard you talk about Doichi now and we have Doichi objects in our collection, but I never understood how poor our institution was because I didn't realize the, the worth and the value of Doichi. And of course this, you know, this is a direct result of devaluing Doichi. Mm -hmm. And devaluing Doji was done precisely to make Sami appear more primitive, right? And, and uh, you know, lower on, uh, on the biological development. So the hierarchical development of, you know, bio biologically lesser, inferior to the Norwegians or the Swedes or the Finns or, you know. Yes. Um, and so, it, I guess going back to this, this, this is something that we need to unlearn as well, you know? Yeah, and it is, um, and I'm also super aware of that. I have this sort of heartbreaking story about Doichi. Uh. Um, that when I was going to attend high school, I wanted to go to an arts and crafts high school, but they had Doichi as a, um, uh, what's it called? As a fog? Oh yeah, as one of the... 
uh, subject. Course, yeah, subject. Yes, uh, Deutsche was a subject in the school. And I had grown up and learned that, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to just sit and sew in leather. Mm. Uh, and so I chose to not do that and not immerse myself in that culture. And four years later, yeah. <laughs> I realized my mistake. And, um, and that just shows what was coded in me. Mm. And I have never had a conscious relationship to Dwechi before I realized that I was Sami. But somehow still that was ingrained in my, in my knowledge about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's also been about unlearning all of these things. Yeah. Uh, and basically like unlearning colonial narratives. Yes. And just counter them with Sami narratives. Yes. And I think that's uh, what you see in this process where people sort of slowly regain, they reclaim that Sami-ness. Um, this is what it's actually about. It's about opposing what colonialism inflicted. And it's about opposing the power of definition that colonizing society took mm. and sort of very <laughs> generously used on us. But yeah, I just... I think it's really important that, and it's not about elevating Dwiji at all, it's not about elevating it as if it was somehow lesser, if it were defined as craft, but it's about, it's about framing it in a Sami perspective, you know, this is why I, I personally never refer to Dwiji when I try to describe what it is, I never use the term craft. I never use it. I talk about, you know, a practice of aesthetics, uh, a practice of storytelling, a system of knowledge, an epistemology that includes working with your body. So it's a, it's a form, it's an embodied knowledge. Mm. And I think that's really important to me because words have power. How we define and term things has so much power. So I think, you know, we really need to rework how we, how we use language. Uh, and you know, don't call it kofta, which is the Norwegian phrase, or cult. Yeah. Call it gakti, because that's what it is. Yes. Uh, you know? Just yes, that's a very good point. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's not even about, I mean, yeah, I recognize that so many of us are not comfortable speaking Sami, or we don't have that, um, you know. And some of us are really comfortable speaking Sami, and someone has learned it all their life. So, you know, all shapes and forms there. Uh, but still, if you, you know, things and objects from the Sami culture that we are surrounded by all the time, let's use the Sami words for them. Yes, and they hold so much more meaning than, yeah. the, than the Norwegian ones. We, uh, I just had an, uh, an interesting um, issue. I was helping someone uh, name a piece of art uh, or like listing the materials. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was made from different kinds of leather. So in English, I have to say different kinds of leather, but in Sami, it was very mm. easy. It was like Sisti, it was Nakke, uh, and also Dwelli. Yeah. Because we have all of these super um, precise words yeah. uh, that bring with them completely other connotation than just yeah. leather or skin. Yeah. Yeah. Someone actually once told me that, you know, the thing is that when I speak to you, even if, you know, we can speak in Sami, we can speak in Norwegian or Swedish, it doesn't matter. If we don't use the terms, the Sami terms, then we need to spend so much time explaining because these terms doesn't exist outside of Sami language. No. And this person also made a very point that it was so important to use these terms and to understand them because what happens if they're gone? You know, how do you tell your story when the words to tell it no longer exist? Yeah, and the words carry knowledge. Yeah. So then the knowledge would yeah, yeah, yeah. disappear completely. Yeah, of course. And this is like, when we t and this is why when we talk about assimilation, it's not assimilation as such. It's a cultural genocide. It's about killing everything that is, you know, other, that yes. is Sami or indigenous. Language is part of that. Yes. The knowledge system, you know, Dwiji as knowledge system is part of that. Yes. And, and I think maybe what I'm wearing is a good example of this because I am wearing an Ilgugakti. Yeah. Uh, and it has been reconstructed. Uh, so 
largely the Norwegian government actually succeeded. Mm. Um, and the Gekti was one of the first things to go. And luckily, some 40, 30 years ago, a group of very talented people did the work to yeah. claim back that knowledge. And I'm not sure that would have been possible for me because I'm the next generation, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be able to speak to the same people. No. Uh, so luckily people have been putting in the work in what I am wearing. So thankfully yeah. I can wear a gekte, but not yeah. everybody can. Yeah. So it's yeah. absolutely a cultural genocide. Yeah, it is a cultural genocide. Yeah. And that's also why, because when we talk about doji as an epistemology, I really think of doyars, like doyarat, are basically the scholars. <laughs> they are scholars. Yeah, yeah. In essence. Yes. So the work that they do is, you know, they work with sources and they work with documentation and archives. Yes. Um, and it's just, we know that because we're Sami and yeah, we know yeah. Dutti. But, um, but we need to get others to understand that as well, yes. I think. Of course, because if I was, whenever I am unsure of how to sew a seam, I don't go and read about it in a book. Of course, mm. I, I go onto Instagram, find good doyas who know how to do this. And yeah. I see, how are you doing this? Or yeah. I would ask them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they are the sources, not yeah. the... Yeah, not the typical Google it. Yes, and another thing I also like, another thing that we also do, or at least I do, is you know when you're in meetings and you're in social gatherings and people, and you can be like, can I just look at? And then you start oh, yeah, flipping yeah. each other's, you know, you go with that and you flip the duck and oh, so this good, this is a good scene. Yes, yes. yes. And then you have this really. You know, basically, it's like we're invading each other's space, but it's you know it's totally fine because this is what you do and like yeah. look and start picking on each other's work and like looking at the seams and like yeah yeah yeah. So when I was in the um, uh, in a course for learning how to sew purses, uh, the the teacher she told us what you need to do is when you're at a party you need to go up to someone who has a pretty purse and you have to ask can I look inside of it can I see how you have done this. So every time I'm at a party, I'm like, oh, that's a nice purse. Can I see how you have fastened the straps? <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's how I have learned to fasten them this way. Yeah. And that's not what we learned in the course, but I have seen that on pretty purses. I have yeah. gone up to people and asked, can I see? Yeah. How is it done? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also when I uh, learned to sew gactis, luckily I have a girlfriend who also has a from my same area. Mm. And most of the time I would just look at her gakti yeah. and be like, where is the seam hitting? How is this done? How is this done? Hmm. Yeah. And, and, that's the, um, uh, and that's the type of knowledge that I don't think a lot of Sami people realize that they have mm. when they have grown up with wearing uh, gaktis and surrounding yeah. themselves with duetchi. Because using duetchi, looking at duetchi is so important mm. in the process of learning it. So my girlfriend, yeah. she doesn't practice duetchi, but she knows so much so I can ask her, yeah. is, does this look right? Yeah. And she will immediately know yes or no. Yeah. 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 And this also like, this is, uh, this actually points to this important fact that our objects and things are sources for us in yes. a completely different way yes. because they are sources of knowledge and we learn by, you know, I think, um, I often think that, you know, I don't know if you've ever been uh, to Aita in Jokmok. No, sorry. Or Yeah, okay. And Rido Duattar as well in Karashok. They have these amazing spaces dedicated in their museums where people, like normal people, like basically everyone that wants to can just contact the museum, ask if they can look at certain objects and they get to go into this room and sit with the objects, touching them, working with them, taking pictures and drawing them. Mm. And this is something that is very, in, in a Scandinavian context, this is very unique to Sami museums because the Sami museums understand this, that, you know, yes, yeah. our things, our objects, this is our knowledge. When yes. we work with them, we learn in a completely different... It's the same as going into a Norwegian... For a Norwegian student to go into a library and read books. What we yeah. do instead is we go into Sami museums and read the objects. Yes, they open books, we open purses. Yes, yes. precisely. Absolutely. I know. Maybe that's a good place to stop having... I think maybe that's a good place to stop. Yeah. I think we've talked for 
a long time. A long time. We could probably continue this conversation yes. and we will absolutely do so. Yes. Hopefully soon. But yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. Mm, it's thank been you a for pleasure. Coming. It's been lovely talking about Doji. Yes. It's um, yeah. It's a privilege. It's, really? it's a privilege. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.